So if I could just ask you to come and take a seat, please. Looks like we've got lots of discussion going on over there already. Have we got any more chairs at the back there if needed? There's a bunch of stalls under the bar there if you need some extra seats. And there's also some at the front here. Okay, welcome. Welcome to another WordPress London Meetup. Uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of quick bits of housekeeping uh, before we get started. Uh, I just wanted to let you know the format of this evening. Uh, we do have a speaker, then we're going to go into a break. We're then going to go into a slightly different session uh, for the second half of this evening. Uh, for those of you that are familiar and have been to uh, WPLDM before, could I just ask your mobile phones are on silence out of respect for the speakers, please? Uh, there is Wi-Fi available. Uh, why guest Yoti let me surf if you want to access the Wi-Fi. Uh, we will be taking photographs this evening. If you uh, wouldn't like to be included in the photos, please do let Gary know uh, over here. We can make sure that you are removed or if you could just move yourself to the side, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Your hosts this evening, uh, are myself, Dan, Diane over back there, we then got Gary over here with the camera and Paul stood the back there. If you have any questions, any thoughts, feedback, anything that you'd like to share with us, uh, we would love to hear from you. Do please reach out to one of the four of us. We are continually looking for uh, new speakers for uh, this event. If you are interested in sharing uh, some knowledge if you think you know what I've got something that I've been doing recently or I've found this plugin recently that I've been using for a while we'd love to hear from you uh, there's there's this ever going uh, challenge to try and bring speakers in um, again, this is a, obviously a community focused event without the community yourselves uh, we wouldn't be here we wouldn't be able to have run these events so please if you do have a talk we'd love to hear from you uh, before we get started, I just want to say a quick thanks to our sponsors, the power to simplify, build, secure, and run your web apps and websites, Blesk. Uh, simplifying the life of sysadmins and SMBs the, uh, with web ops and web hosting. Uh, web hosting crafted with care. SiteGround provide hosting, uh, hosting services crafted for top speed and security with 24-7 expert support. Uh, digital experience a digital experience platform built for growth, WP Engine, founded uh, in um, 2010. And uh, the WordPress multilingual plugin, Weglot, uh, translate and display WordPress websites in different languages. And the new digital identity platform, verify the identity of your website users uh, and let them log in with their biometrics, Yoti. Not only do Yoti sponsor the event, they also give us this wonderful venue uh, for us to use this evening. So please do do take a look. The Yoti plugin uh, is available. There is a Yoti WordPress plugin available uh, for us to install, simply install on our website and allow our users to log in and, and interact with our websites via the biometrics uh, and use your use their platform as an identity platform. So please do. Have we got? Where's the Yoti team? Have they ducked out for this evening? I think he's just shot out the back there. Um, but uh, Mari is around. If you do have any questions for him, uh, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them for you. Uh, I just want to say a quick thanks to our supporters this evening. Blue 37, a strategic thinking team of digital experts with a creative edge. Paul Smart, uh, website design, marketing, and consultancy for businesses who seek growth through digital. And Sortic, a digital sports agency delivering high profile high traffic sports websites on WordPress. So on to this evening. Um, as I mentioned at the start there, we're going to have a just slightly different format this evening. Uh, we have got Adam uh, who's going to be giving us our first talk this evening. 
We're then going to go into a slight mix of lightning sessions and our lean coffee discussion. We want to open it up. If you are interested in giving a lightning talk yourself, it's an opportunity, 10 minutes maximum, to come up here and just talk. So if there's, a, if there's something you're aware of, something you've been doing, we'd love to hear about it. It's really an opportunity for you to just come up and let us know. If you are interested in giving a lightning talk, um, it would be great to just get a couple of details from you, your name, company, etc. Uh, if you could come and chat with either myself, Gary, Diane, or Paul during the break, uh, we can make sure we can get your details correct, uh, and then we can obviously introduce you. Before we go on to this evening, though, uh, onto our speakers this evening, we're going to offer this opportunity for our community announcements. It's just an opportunity if you're aware of anything that's going on in and around the community, um, just to, to stick your hand up and say, this is happening. Uh, it could be that there's an event going on. It could be that you are looking to hire. Uh, it could be looking that you're to be you're looking to be hired. Uh, so please, if you are aware of anything that's going on in and around the WordPress, PHP, open source community, just an opportunity for you to stick your hands up. Yes. <laughs> yes, get the microphone. Hello, uh, yeah, my name's Chris. Uh, me and Andy, we work at AS Watson, which is uh, basically a big company uh, retailer, owns uh, Superdrug, Perfume Shop, and Savers, amongst lots of other different businesses in Europe. Uh, we're here basically because we're looking for two uh, permanent WordPress developers. So if you are interested, uh, please f uh, feel free to uh, come and talk to me and Andy tonight. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. And how about how do they go about applying to I'm going to have a chat with you. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Hi. Louise Taylor from Indigo Tree. We're also looking for WordPress developers for permanent employment. And we're going to be better than them. <laughs> <laughs> Little asterisks. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else looking to hire? Anybody else, anybody else aware of any other events, community announcements going on, anything around the, uh, the space? Anybody looking to be hired? Chris? Uh, right, so I'm a WordPress developer, uh, seven years full stack experience, mostly in PHP. I am currently in full time employment, but I'm looking for new opportunities. Uh, so I'm open to contract, uh, but preferably permanent. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. So everybody jumps straight over. <laughs> yes, go on, Justine. Hello. Hello. I am a PHP developer uh, with about four years freelancing contract experience. And uh, I'm looking for a new PHP role. I have used uh, frameworks including uh, Bootstrap and Laravel. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, fantastic. Well, we've got a couple of things that I just want to uh, cover before we move on. This little event going on in a week tomorrow, WordCamp London. <laughs> anybody, just out of interest, anybody not been to a WordCamp before? Excellent, that's, that's quite a high number, that's fantastic. So, just for those of you that just put your hand up, just so you're aware, a WordCamp is uh, the official conference for WordPress. They are, uh, the WordCamp London specifically is a three day event. Uh, we're going to be running from the 5th to the 7th of April. The 5th of April is a contributor day, so it's an opportunity for you to contribute and give back to the WordPress open source project as a whole. Uh, you don't have to write code to be able to contribute to WordPress, there are many, many ways. Um, that you, you can get involved. Uh, I think last year we had, Gary, was it 14 teams last year at WordCamp London? S somewhere, somewhere in the region of 14 odd teams. Those teams are made up of individuals with different skill sets. So you could be on the marketing team, you could be on the polyglots team, you could be on the documentation team. There are many, many ways to contribute back to WordPress. The 6th and 7th of April are the two conference days. Now WordCamp London has a three track, is a three track event. We've got 
40, uh, sorry, where we got 44 speakers over those three days. Um, just to give you some numbers, we've got over this 12, uh, sorry, this uh, three day event, we've got 12 MC supporting us. We've got 14 event organizers. We've got 34 volunteers. We've got 34 sponsors. We've got 44 speakers, 118 contributors, currently 438 tickets are sold for it. Over 2,000 items of swag are going to be given out to you lot for free. And there's going to be about 5,500 hot drinks served over those, two d over those three days. There's a lot going on uh, at a work camp. Um, the, uh, the ways that you can get involved are many and varied. The team of volunteers that are organising this event have worked tirelessly over the last several months uh, to bring this event to the community. You get, as I say, a three-day conference. You get your swag, you get your lunches, you get your after-party, you get uh, all of that wonderful content over those three days for 40 pounds. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So you will get more value out of just the food alone over those three days. But then let's let's look at all the the, the amazing content. This this uh, the lineup of speakers is an international lineup of speakers. There are these these people are travelling from all over the world uh, to take part in this event to um, to share their knowledge and to be part of uh, giving back to the community. So if you haven't already got your tickets. You are limited in the number. Of, we are limited in the number of tickets that are now available for this. The event itself is held at the um, Metropolitan University in London, so very accessible, very easy to get to. There's, um, the, as I say, we've got uh, three tracks, so there is an uh, there's an awful lot going on throughout those those three days. To enable an event such as this, we do need volunteers. Now, we do have almost all our volunteers we just need a couple more if you're interested in getting involved in this event um, being a volunteer is a really great way to get integrated if you're if you're new to the community or you've not been to a work camp before volunteering at a work camp is a really good opportunity to uh, uh, to, to be involved because you are you're there for a purpose often if you are attending an event uh, maybe you're on your own you may not know people being a volunteer means that you're there for a purpose. So people actually come to you. People come to talk to you because they they expect a level of, of knowledge of what you're doing. Now, we obviously share the knowledge. We make sure that you know what you're doing as a volunteer. So if you are interested, not only do you get to be part of it, we also give you a ticket for free. And you're only expected to work for about half a day maximum um, over that period of, as a volunteer. Tickets are on sale, but they are limited. As I said, there aren't there aren't many left. Uh, I think if all the hands that went up in the room just now bought a ticket, we would pretty much be sold out. So if you if you haven't joined us, uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, if you've not been to work camp before, just to make you aware, the um, organisation of work camp uh, and not just work camp London but work camps throughout the UK because they're not just specific to London they actually happen on a global scale uh, we've got um, work camp Edinburgh we've got work camp Bristol work camp Brighton work camp uh, Belfast uh, work camp Manchester I think have we missed anybody on the work camps in the UK I think Glasgow yep Birmingham so there are lots of work camps happening throughout the UK uh, the management of them happen as much as possible in the public domain and WP slack dot UK uh, is where a lot of that management happens the UK slack team is a team that's open to anybody visit this site you'll be redirected to a slack sign up drop your email address in you can get in there and get involved um, and as I say these the management of these work camps as well as meetups um, is is open and available for you to get involved so if the conversations that you have this evening um, are of interest and you want to continue those conversations post this event this is a really good place to do that as I mentioned these work camps happen all over the country so we've got Bristol coming up uh, Bristol is the 17th to the 19th of May uh, they've just released their speaker schedule uh, and this one 
35 pounds again a three-day event for 35 pounds a tech conference can you gonna get that into a tech conference for 35 pounds uh, oh that should have been work camp Europe <laughs> that was a fail um, I just want to say a quick shout out to WP and Up. WP and Up is a charity that supports and promotes positive mental health within the WordPress community. Uh, these, the WP and Up as a charity is enabling us to uh, run events such as this. Uh, and of course, thank you. We, we couldn't do that without our sponsors. As an initiative within WP and Up, we want to understand the current state of mental health and well-being within the WordPress community. Now, this is something that has literally been launched today. Um, and we would like to invite you uh, uh, as part of a very first group to to get involved and answer a, a very short questionnaire that we are wanting to understand uh, that's enabling us to understand uh, the state of the WordPress community's mental health and well-being if you visit wpnup.org forward slash go you'll be redirected to our little bot and you'll have a little conversation with our bot and that bot will take you through a number of questions and really help us to understand how the community is in relation to mental health at this stage. Uh, as I say, we've only just released this today um, and we would appreciate any feedback that you may have on this. If you get to there and think, oh, actually, no, that's not quite right, or actually we could do changing this, we'd love to hear from you. This, everything that we do within WPNUP is about the community and focused around the community. Um, and there have been many, many occasions where the things that we've been doing within WPNUP has been massively changed because of the feedback from the community. So please do visit wpnup.org forward slash go. It's completely anonymous. We're not collecting any personal data um, as, you as you go through this uh, survey. So we'd love to hear from you on that one. Okay, that's it on the community announcements. Uh, just want to do a quick WP and update. We've not WP update post. We've not done this for a while. Uh, it's an opportunity if you, uh, again, if you're aware of things that are going on in and around our space um, that are more related to this thing's happened recently in this plugin or this thing's happening over in core, then just, again, opportunity for you to let us know. So has anybody got anything they want to share? Anybody aware of anything that's been going on in the space? Hi. Um so Jetpack decided to include a feature in itself where if you search for, well, if you install Jetpack and connect your site to your WordPress.com account, and then you go to the plugins page, and then you search for certain stuff, I've tested it with CDN, um, Jetpack will insert a little call out to the list of plugins that are returned that says, hey, by the way, I have a CDN. The problem being that the plugin developer handbook explicitly states that that is forbidden. So uh, Automatic and Jetpack people in particular are currently getting heat from uh, the community about this. And uh, we haven't even touched on the different tracking um, that Jetpack is performing on your site about you and your visitors and sending it back to automatic. Excellent, thank you. That's uh, interesting, interesting challenging discussions. So are you aware the discussions, are they happening on the Make blog at the moment, do you know? Or that's so discussions happen two on two places that I am aware of. One of them is the, um, the WP UK uh, Slack that Dan just mentioned. And the other one is a Slack called Post Status, uh, which is a closed and kind of like a premium community where you have to pay for access, but has a bunch of uh, non-UK people as well. Um, and also, if you shoot uh, an email over to plugins at wordpress.org and kindly inquire about why this is happening, I'm sure they will be happy to give you feedback on it. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else aware of anything else that's going on in, in the community? Uh, sorry, in the WordPress space at the moment? Yeah. I know that f I th I'm pretty sure 5.2 beta 1 is out. 
which is due to be released end of April, I think it is. Yep. So I, I know that's happening. Yes. I'm not sure. Have we got a firm date on 5.2 at the moment? No, no. April 30th, possibly. Uh, so with uh, the 5.2, the uh, minimum version of PHP for uh, running that will uh, jump from 5.2.4, which it has been for probably 10 years or so, uh, up to uh, PHP 5.6. Uh, as part of that, that means kind of now WordPress core could potentially start making use of some of the syntax that's available in 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, uh, and 5.6 and above um, that wasn't previously available for PHP 5.2. There has been a post on the make.wordpress.org slash core blog that says uh, about changing the coding standards um, to make use of some of these features. Uh, short array syntax is one of them. Uh, looking at how we format kind of closures, whether they can be used with um, when you're doing action hooks uh, and filter hooks uh, and so on. So if you're interested in coding standards, then go and have a look at that post, leave your feedback. Some people like the idea of being able to use a short array syntax. Some people prefer the long uh, format of array uh, and then brackets as well. So uh, go and have a look on that. Um, once a discussion has happened and the feedback uh, has, has been brought in, then the handbook will be updated and from that the WordPress coding standards, the SNFs that PHP Code Sniffer uses, uh, will be updated to those as well. Is this the next contentious issue? <laughs> Controversy? I don't know what you mean. Let's 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 have that in the lean coffee. How how do you like your how do you like your array? Short syntax or? Uh, and one of the controversial bits is about uh, Yoda condition, which basically says uh, it is a way of writing code so that you try and avoid accidental bugs, so that you avoid assignments when you're actually meant to do uh, a, c a comparison. Um, so Yoda conditions is one of the few things that kind of WordPress does. Uh, core does that pretty much the rest of the PHP world kind of don't seem to like um, but because of the WordPress coding standards now uh, stopping assignments in conditions um, then we might actually be able to do away with Yoda conditions as well so some people find them very naturally back to front uh, and therefore hard to read and so we might be able to do away with those. Excellent thank you. There's, uh, there's, been, there's quite a few interesting things coming up with five, the 5.2. Also now we've got the, the Gutenberg, or the, the block editor project uh, off the blocks, uh, so to speak. Uh, there's some interesting stuff happening uh, around this, stuff that's been probably bottlenecks a little bit uh, because of the block editor project. Uh, but yeah, we've got, I just want to read, read a little bit about this. Um, this is introducing a recovery mode for fixing fatal errors. Oh, oh, they recognize the who's seen the white screen of death. I thought I might see a few more hands than that, to be honest. That's quite a low number. <laughs> okay, so just on this track ticket, um, just want to read what it says on there. Using the new fatal handle handler introduced in track ticket 44962, an email is sent to the admin when a fatal error occurs. This email incurs, uh, includes a secret link to enter recovery mode. When clicked, the link will be va will validate on a success. A, uh, sorry, will will be validated on a success. A cookie will be placed on the client, enabling recovery mode for that user. This functionality is ex uh, is uh, executed early before plugins and themes are loaded in order to be unaffected by potential fatal errors these might be causing. So in other words, this is allowing us to still access our site even if we're seeing the white screen of death. Who thinks that's a good idea? You don't like the implementation? No. Any, do you care to? There was a discussion at WP Hooked about it because um, it depends who the admin email is going to and there are occasions if you're doing work on behalf of clients where they want the admin email to be them and then ha setting a cookie on their computer isn't the most helpful thing to do. Yeah. So there's uh, there's a road map and I think Jenny was involved in a in looking at looking at it and then the other thing is it also I don't think they've got it for multi-site yet either. 
so there's a couple of bits that sure. are going to need refining in mm -hmm. future releases yes yeah i'm absolutely sure the um uh, i think that that issue there with the admin i think that's a slightly broader issue um, than specifically yeah. to this but of course yes this has has a big impact here doesn't it yeah. yes i think the, the the concept is amazing um but yes maybe the implementation uh, there's some, some work it would just be really helpful if if you could set alternative emails so that the email goes out to other people rather than just whoever's set as the main admin yeah uh, very valid point. Excellent. Uh, something else that's come up recently. Anybody else use this easy WPSMTP plugin? Anybody got this installed on sites? Okay, I thought I might see a few more hands, to be honest. Uh, so there was a zero day vulnerability. Zero, zero day vulnerability in WordPress uh, in easy WP SMTP plugin. Uh, it was fixed uh, two days ago. Um, it, uh, it was actually brought in in the uh, 1.3.9 version. So if you had updated to 1.3.9, make sure you get updated to the 1.3.9.1, which has resolved this issue. Uh, but the 1.3.9 brought in a new feature allowing for uh, export and import, a uh, new export import feature that actually added this vulnerability. Uh, so please do make sure your site is updated at all times. Better to have auto update and your site break than to not be updating and your site be affected by issues such as this. Anybody else aware before we move on of stuff going on? Yes, Adam. We got a microphone. Oh. <laughs> Do you need to swap microphones for a minute? All I was going to add to that was the fact that when that zero day came out, there was also one about social warfare. If you use the same plugin, it's got the same vulnerability. So again, if you're running that version, you need to update it. But to give you an idea, when I last looked at it, between those two plugins, they had just under 400,000 installs. And at the time I checked, there was only about 130,000 websites had been updated. So there were actually already websites that were being hacked as a result. Mm. That, that 400,000, did that, that relate to the, just the SMTP? plug-in. Well, that was both combined, was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so obviously that's a considerable number of sites that are affected. Excellent. Okay, so if we do we have anything else at all? No? Okay. I'm now going to introduce you to Adam, and I apologise, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the full surname. Please forgive me. <laughs> Um, Adam is going to be giving his talk this evening, WordPress, uh, WordPress Care Plans. Uh, Adam is the founder of Rocket WP, uh, it's specializing in ensuring the security, reliability, and speed of websites for owners, uh, developers, agencies, and designers. Uh, so talking about the vulnerabilities, obviously a perfect opportunity. So please give Adam a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, just while Adam's getting himself set up here, um, I just encourage you to just turn to somebody to your left or right and say hello, somebody you don't know. Okay, all suitably acquainted? Excellent, thank you. Well, please, <laughs> please welcome Adam. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks very much. Um, as Dan said, I'm Adam. I'm the founder of a company called Rocket WP. And as he said, we look after WordPress sites. We're not designers, we're not developers. We literally look after and make sure that one of the probably the biggest area of WordPress isn't overlooked, which is the updating. Okay, so what I'm gonna cover is what we mean by care plan, why you should provide them, how you should provide them, and what we do um, to look after the WordPress sites that we're asked to manage. So what are care plans? As everybody here knows, WordPress needs regular updating. So like with the easy W uh, SMTP plugin vulnerability and social warfare, keeping your sites up to date is really important, but it's something that often gets forgotten. So a care plan is basically a bundle of services that should be used to ensure that your WordPress site is kept up to date, backed up, secure, and online. You should be doing it at least weekly on every single site you develop and design. But as I've said, it's something that people just forget. They just forget to do it. So why should you, you know, at the end of the day, provide a care plan? There are benefits, huge benefits to you. Now, firstly, you can improve your MRR. Does anybody know what I mean by MRR? Great, there's a couple. Okay, MRR is monthly recurring revenue. Um, now, what happens with a lot of designers, especially self-employed designers and small agencies, is you end up in what's called the famine and feast cycle. Yeah, it's, it's fading in and out, isn't it? too close perfect fantastic um, so what we're trying to do is break what's called the famine and feast cycle so when you sign up a new client chances are you'll get an initial payment depending on how big and how complex the site is you might get a couple of staging payments and then once it finally goes live you get your lion's share of your money okay so that's the feast cycle feast part of the cycle and then you start the famine side where slowly but surely as your bills need to be paid, as you're trying to find another client and another project, that money's going down and down and down till you can end up in a famine situation. Now I've been there, I'm sure a lot of other people have been there, where at the end of the day, you take on a project that really you shouldn't have taken on. You've taken on a customer that you shouldn't have taken on purely because you need the additional money. So by providing a care plan, and costing it into your project costs, your cost to your customers, an ongoing cost after the site has been finished, you can start building up your MRR. So it might be a case if you charge your customer £100 a month for looking after their website. Doesn't sound like much until you start talking about you're doing 5, 10, 15 sites a year. At £100 a month, by the end of the year, you could have between a thousand and fifteen hundred pound a month coming in, which helps you get through those famine times. So you don't have to go out. There isn't that almost desperation. The other thing we say is it, it's regular contact with your customers. So chances are your care plan will include some sort of reporting. Hi, aren't we marvelous? This is what we've done over the last week or the last month with your website. The other nice thing is you're constantly looking at your customers' websites, the old ones that you've done, and you may well, during a new project, find something that, ah, oh, do you know what? That, that feature that we put on for Joe Bloggs' website was really good, and I'm sure Mr. Smith would love it. So there's also sometimes the opportunity to do an upsell. So that's why not only should you provide in them anyway because it's something that WordPress does, there's the incentive to carry on doing it and making sure it's up. So what's the easiest way to provide care plans? Well, we've already said that doing nothing is not an option. You can let auto updates take care of it. Um, now on this point, I will disagree with Dan. I don't like doing auto updates. Um, reasons are you never know when they're gonna run and you never know if they're gonna take a site down. It's much better to think, okay, I'm gonna update this site, I'm gonna do it now, and I'm gonna do it, I know I've got a backup, and I'm here looking at the website, so if there is an issue, I can roll back. You can do it yourself. 
Now, by DIY, I mean tools such as Manage WP. Does anybody use Manage WP? Yep. Manage WP, for those of you who don't know it, is a management tool that you can add all of your WordPress sites into, and it gives you one central place. So you can see all the updates that are required. You can roll out all the updates that are required. You can do that for free, which is really nice. Um, if you want to start automating the process, i.e. you want daily backups, you want management report, uh, sorry, uh, client reports, you want uptime monitoring, then you can pay. The last option is to outsource it um, to a company such as ours, but it's entirely up to you. The main thing about it is providing the care plans and ensuring that your websites are kept up to date and are secured. There was a tweet going out a couple of days ago about... Um, it was a small county in the USA. They were being slated because their site got hacked. It was a WordPress site. And the messages were basically, I told you not to use WordPress. Mm, no, I told you to keep it updated and secured. So there are real world reasons why you should keep a website up to date and secure. So what's our recipe for doing it? How do we do it? We use Manage WP to manage everybody's website. Um, we do daily backups at a minimum. We send out weekly reports. We do daily vulnerability scanning. And we also provide additional services on top of that that you wouldn't maybe necessarily want to just provide off your own back. And the reason we do that is because it frees up your time. You are all developers and designers and that's your core business. That's what you want to do. That's your bread and butter. We don't do design. I can't design for Toffee. I'm not a designer. And I can't code to, couldn't code anything. So that's what we do. Now, to update a WordPress website is not a case of logging in and clicking update all. You can do it that way. But eventually, it will cause you an issue. So the way we do it is we do every single backup. Every single plugin is done manually. So we'll back it up. We'll update the plugin. Is the site still working? Update the next plugin. Is the site still working? Update the theme. Is it still working? So that's the process that you should really go through when doing these updates to ensure that they go through and ensure that they all occur and work and the site is not affected. So that takes time, and that's what we try and do. So we give you time. We white label it. You can on-sell it. So you can still make the money for providing a care plan and doing the routine maintenance, but... You're, you're, you're making money. I haven't really got much more to say. I was hoping there might be some questions that people want to ask about what we do and how we do it. Yep. Excellent. Adam, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Adam. So the question I had is, how do you come up with a, a package or packages that you can offer clients um, like that include different levels of support, or how do you go about kind of pricing up this productized service? Okay, we, um, we've looked at specific services such as uh, our, all our plans come for starters with iTheme Security Pro. Uh, the reason we like iTheme Security Pro is we pay one subscription at the beginning of the year and we can look after as many sites as we like. Um, so we are able to add that cost in, and, and we think, okay, well, each site, I think it's $300 for a year license. We work out how much that's going to cost. We work out the rough amount of time we spend per website per week doing the updates. Um, it's I think it's Security Pro. Security Pro. They do a free version, which is really good. Um, just iTheme security, but the Pro adds a lot of other features like two-factor authentication um, uh, and, and better control of passwords and things, but iTheme security is what we use for that. We also add on WP Rocket, which is a caching um, plugin. So again, it's a premium plugin that you would have to go out and buy. We buy it on bulk so we can install it on all our websites that we manage. We also use Imagify which is an image compression software, so it optimizes images. Again, they do a free version of it, but it will only optimize up to a certain size. It'll optimize on your server, whereas if you buy the premium edition, the images are sent off to Imagify. They do all their wonderful stuff and send it back down to you. So that's how 
we differentiate ourselves, you know, apart from other people that are offering the same service. Excellent. Got another question here? So do you mirror all your sites that you've got that you look after your customers? In what, sorry, what do you mean by mirroring? So when you back up the web, so you back the website up, you do the updates, mm -hmm. and then the theme breaks. Then we would roll back. And who repairs the theme? Well, we would then look at what was causing that theme to break down. So we would then look, is it a problem with a plugin? Is there a plugin that could be updated? You'll quite often find themes which have plugins bundled in may break if the plugin's upgraded but the theme hasn't been. So, for example, if you... A lot of themes come with WP Bakery built in, and I've seen some people tick the box to buy the WP Bakery upgrade. So they've upgraded WP Bakery, but the theme has not been designed to work with the new plugin. So chances are it's caused by a plugin problem, and that's why we would need to roll back. We would then investigate what was causing the problem. Excellent. We've got another question back here. So we've got another question. So we have we, we do use developers. We don't have any developers in house, but we've got developers that we call on. All right. You mentioned about uh, whenever you so uh, something is updated, let's say you update the plugins and then you check if the website is still uh, on. How do you do that roughly? Okay, we usually do that by opening up either an incognito window or a private browser, or having another machine. Um, to make sure because quite often if you update a plugin, especially if it's using caching, you might not be looking at the right version of the site. So we'll open up an incognito window and check the site by opening it and clicking through the menus and any additional functionality that's there. So, so you don't have any specific tools or a custom code that does more in-depth check? <laughs> there, are, there are tools out there. Manage WP offers something called a safe update. The uh, problem with safe update is all it actually does is take a, a, a snapshot of what the front of the website looks like before doing the plugin and then after doing the plugin. And as long as those two pictures match, it says the update's safe. Well, as soon as you might click on one of the menu items, you might find that actually the site's broken. Uh, Plesk, who's one of the sponsors, come out something called Smart Updates, which supposedly uses AI to check whether a site is working. Um, I personally haven't tested it yet, um, but that supposedly is out there. It should want to work. It's about five pound per site per month you want to run that on. All right, so you also check the dashboard if anything is broken there. Yep. Okay. All yep. right, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Any more questions? Adam, do you, your pricing model, do you find, do you offer a monthly, annually? Do you find there's a benefit to either or? Uh, we uh, okay. Our, our pricing is based on monthly, more towards if it's a site owner who's coming to the site, so they would be charged a monthly fee depending on the level of service. We're also open to annual payments. Um, if you pay annually, you basically pay for ten months, get two months free. For agencies, the price is slightly different um, because of the way we white label it, and because we're not the ones going out and getting the customers and looking after the customer, they get a discount. And again. They c they've got the choice to pay monthly or annually. Most agencies pay monthly because obviously the number of sites hopefully is changing, i.e. going up. Excellent. So you, you white label for agencies as well? Yeah, we're it's completely white labeled. Uh, Manage WP gives us the ability to white label built in. So um, it goes from there. We also can white label your help desk if you want us to look after the help desk. Um, and the way our telephone system works is we can also add specific numbers to it so if we need to dial out. So we try and do as much as we can from what I've, when I've spoken to designers and agencies who call it the mundane boring stuff, um, you know, domains and mm -hmm. migrations and stuff yeah. like that. Just out of interest, oh, sorry, another question. You, how long have you been doing this, roughly? Um, I've been working with servers for 20 odd years, specifically WordPress over the last three. Okay. Have you seen much of a, a drop in terms of the numbers of issues with updates over that time period? Oh, 100%. Uh, the big I we, we find the most troublesome sites are sites where they've not been updated for quite some time, um, where they've just been left to what I would call rot in a corner somewhere and suddenly someone's realised that, oh, they've opened it up and the little update symbol is saying 20-odd updates. 
we tend to find that's when we get the issues. And it's more than likely because one of the plugins should really have been retired and um, changed for something else. That's it. We've got two days. <laughs> Hi there, Adam. Uh, Hi. Could you run us through the onboarding process? So let's say I'm interested. I come to you. I have a website for you to take care of. What happens then? Okay. The first thing we would do is uh, take it back up. Uh, the next thing we would do is apply all the updates and we would then um, install the plugins based on the service that we provide in. So as standard you'd get iTheme Security Pro installed. If you were on our middle package, our advanced package, we would also install uh, WP Rocket and do the caching. We would do uh, Imagify and optimize your images. And then if you were on our advanced plus package, we offer as part of that the security web application firewall and the security server side scanner. So we will take you through that onboard process and what we do is we use MailChimp. So we've got specific emails that come out during that process to keep you informed. And again, what we do with our agency staff, if they want to, we'll duplicate that and they can change that. So it's got their um, logos, their specific text they want on it. So again, it's their message coming from them. Everything we do, we use Todoist to build templates for so we can replicate it again and again and again throughout the sites. Thank you. I think there was just another question over here. Sorry, go back with you a second. I, uh, I, uh, I've installed uh, iThemes on my websites as well. Have you noticed that uh, sometimes it happens that they get attacked more when you do that? I've not noticed that they get attacked more. What I've noticed is you actually get alerted more to the fact that your site is being attacked. Um, one of the things with installing a security package is suddenly you start believing you're getting issues because suddenly you're getting a phone call saying, oh, I can't log in. Um, I had a conversation recently for a customer that we look after and the lady wanted me to switch it off because it was giving her headaches. And I had to try and say to her in a really nice way, the only reason you have been locked out is because you have tried to put your password in wrong 10 times. <laughs> it took 10 attempts before it blocked you from accessing your website. Getting security right for anything, doesn't matter whether it's your website, whether it's your PC, your mobile phone or anything, there comes a very fine line between making your security strong enough so that you stop an attacker and you and you basically for you want your attacker to get bored trying to attack your site or whatever it is there's a very thin line between getting that right and not upsetting the person trying to get in um, you know security is there for a reason Adam, sorry, what was your last name, please? Takawa Yates. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions at all? Thanks. Um, what is the, the top one thing that you would recommend to all of us here that we could do to care for our website? Back up. <laughs> <laughs> That's How the often? Best. Daily. After every modification. And... Um, back up once an hourly. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions at all? No? Adam, thank you very much. Please give Adam a big round of applause. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're just going to take a quick five minute break now. Um, there is no pizza left. You're obviously hungry tonight, <laughs> but I think there might be some drinks. Uh, please do help yourself to the swag, but please, 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 please vote there's a whole load of topic, com topic uh, conversation topics over there. Please vote. You get three votes. Just stick a dot on the ones that you want to vote for. You can chuck all three votes on one card or stick them across multiples. Entirely up to you. Um, so we're going to take a quick five minutes and then we're going to come back. Also, if anybody does have a lightning talk that they want to give as well, do approach one of us.
have have we all voted yeah we, we So, has anybody not voted? Come on, we need some votes. No? Well, you're going to love this. We're going to kick off the discussion as well. <laughs> uh, the Lean Coffee session will be us looking at the uh, votes that we've had over there, looking at the station. After those three minutes, it'll be a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whether we want to continue or move on to the next topic. Simple as that. Step up this evening, so really appreciate everybody. Uh, appreciate appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully, we have got Louise from Indigo Tree. Uh, yes, so I'm going to introduce you to Louise. Louise uh, is a the founder, director of Indigo Tree. Uh, going to be giving her lightning talk this evening entitled Building a Fast WordPress Website. So please give up for Louise. Right. Um, I'm going to talk this evening about a website we built for a client of ours um, that we built it right from the beginning knowing that we wanted to make it as fast as we possibly could bearing in mind that clients always have a limited budget so the website is for a company called a place in the sun there's a, a tv show associated in a property site but the website we were building was particularly a lead generation website um, for currency because they wanted to, um, well, they, they basically make a margin on currency tra transactions and they were partnering up with a company that could help them with that. Um, there were sort of particular constraints. It was only ever going to be lead generation, so there's no sort of transactional um, part to it. However, um, we were not um, involved in the design process. The, the website design was done by them. Um, and they had some particular things around. They specifically wanted to use WordPress. Um, one of the directors we were working with um, is, a, is an existing client of ours. He particularly wanted us to use Gravity Forms because he was familiar with that with his existing website. And then there were a couple of third-party APIs that we had to include. Um, XE, which uh, provides um, currency rates, and then one of the review um, portals which so they could get third-party reviews. And the other thing we were aware of, and one of the reasons we wanted to make it fast, is because when I did a bit of discovery up front, um, they told us they had quite a, a large email list. So if they were going to start promoting the website and doing things like sending out email marketing, then we could expect some spikes in traffic. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we weren't doing an awful lot SEO-wise in Google, but we knew because of the brand and because of the way they were going to be doing some of their marketing, we had to make sure that we took that into account. So, we did some basics. We made sure it was hosted on PHP 7. Um, we made sure that the CSS and the JavaScript was um, minified, and we used Gulp for that within our build process in the theme. Um, we often, when we're building websites, we'll use something like Bootstrap as a starter framework. But I in this case, from the designs, we realized most of the Bootstrap elements actually weren't going to be required. So we decided we'd use a custom grid rather than actually in, um, including lots of unnecessary code as part of Bootstrap to keep the size down. And then we did some clever stuff around um, lazy loading critical and non-critical CSS. All the components on the website were designed in and styled in individual CSS files. 
and then we had a non-critical CSS file and a critical CSS file where those CSS files were being imported in so that we could basically make sure that there was nothing that was going to, to block the page rendering. And um, we what we actually did was have a look as well, because there's other ways of doing it. We thought about inlining critical CSS, but actually it was faster not to. Um, if you inline the critical CSS, then when you go to subsequent pages, um, you can't, well, you end up with um, CSS files that, that when you, um, haven't been cached because you're inlining it, so you're loading it up every single time. Whereas if you actually have your um, individual components and files being brought, brought in, as soon as you land on subsequent pages, basically those CSS files have already been cached. So there was all sorts of little bits we thought about when we were deciding what technical approach to take around that. Um, we also used the plugin just to minify the HTML markup, and we did some work with the HT access file and added um, gzip and then we added a caching plugin and configured that and also added cache control heads of headers to the HT access file um, we uh, the previous speaker spoke about compressing images we off well with all of our clients we typically use tiny ping um, uh, because it means that everything that's uploaded to the media library is compressed on upload so we made sure that that was sorted out as well um, when it came to the um, reviews and the currency rates, we were having to deal with third-party APIs, and sometimes that can cause quite a s an issue and can definitely, if you're pinging a third-party API, cause the web page to load slower while you're waiting for the response. So normally, you would um, load a page in, go and get something like your reviews or your currency rates from the API um, and then cache them for repeat visits. But that, first of all, that means that the first person loading them in ends up with quite a, a slow page load. And if you're getting lots of traffic, so we have had instances on very high traffic websites where if you're trying to ping the API simultaneously, you can actually cause a bit of a problem. Um, and we just wanted to get around that. So what we actually did was we decided instead to um, cache the results of the API calls and run a cron job. So instead of the visitor causing the API to get the results, we actually ran a cron job. In both instances, the currency rates was updated daily and the reviews, although it was being updated all the time, it wasn't critical that the latest review on was, was on the website immediately. So we actually set up cron jobs to run every six hours and then um, the API returns JSON, that's t um, stored as a transient in the database, and then it, it was quicker to call the database. And we did actually test it. It was actually quicker to call the database and display it on the page from that than it was to call the API. So that was the route we took. Um, you have to be a bit careful when you're doing things like updating WordPress that you don't lose all your transients and then you lose all the data. So we did a bit of work around that as well. Um, we, we've got quite a lot of background images on the website. So we often use advanced custom fields to manage custom builds like this where the, the web pages are a particular page layout. This was pre-Gutenberg, by the way, just in case anyone's asking, but we wouldn't be using Gutenberg for this anyway. Um, so we added various image sizes, and then what we actually did was write a function to output the correct image size. So the, the we're basically within the code saying, right, get the field that's related to this particular page and get the image, and then the result of that function is it um, outputs Style, the style with the, dish, the conditional CSS depending on the screen width. So it just means at that point you can be, your people, the, the editor, because the, 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 the um, client in this case wanted to be able to go in and edit pages and change images, that, that none of that needed to be hard coded into the theme in any way whatsoever and it, it would just be um, outputted on the page. But it meant that again, we, you're, you're only loading in images at the right size and the, and the right compression for the device that the website's being looked at on. And then finally, the Gravity Forms. Now, out the box, Gravity Forms is a great plugin. It has lots of really good features, but it's um, 
it loads CSS and JavaScript at the top of the page. It's usually render blocking when in the header. Um, so what we decided to do was we wanted to basically try and load Gravity Forms into the footer. However, there's a little wrinkle to it because when you actually, when the page is actually rendered, the way the Gravity Forms plugin works, it embeds the form code in the right position on the page, and then straight after that, it it embeds some jQuery to help with the processing the form. So if you actually just rendered the page, and you just enqueue your Gravity Form script straight into the footer, you actually end up with a JavaScript error as the page is being loaded. So what we actually did was we wrote a function, well, we added the filters and the hooks to enqueue the scripts into the footer, but then what we did was we um, added a JavaScript event listener, which basically runs Gravity Forms after the page is loaded and makes sure the code is put in at the right place. Now, there is an issue because at that point you can't actually use the, p the form until the page is fully loaded. But by this time we realised we were getting quite a fast page load time. So we actually made a decision to go, well actually nobody is going to be using that form within you know, less than a second of landing on the page. So in fact it wouldn't be a problem for the user for the page to have to be fully loaded before the form was usable, if that makes sense. But that, was, that is just something to think about. If you want to enqueue the scripts in the footer and use this approach and your page is taking five seconds to load anyway, then you could end up with users unable to use your forms. So the speed test results were, um, this is, we, we tested it quite a lot. At the m when I was testing it today, it was loading in um, 600 milliseconds. The best test we got was um, fully loaded in 523 milliseconds which for a WordPress website on decent hosting but nothing particularly special, we think is a pretty good job. So that's how we did it, and if anybody's got any questions, more than happy to discuss. And um, shameless plug, if you want to join our team, then um, we're very friendly, and we're looking for engineers at the moment. Thank you very much. Louise, thank you so much. Um, because we did the lightnings, if you could come back, if after we've had all the lightnings, if you're happy to collectively come back for some Q&A, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to introduce you to Leo. Uh, Leo is the director, founder of SOTIC, uh, and is going to be talking to us tonight about... Um, yeah, I am. Um, hi, my name is Leo. The, the worst thing to do is to actually try and do the technology while you're actually talking. So I'm actually going to have my able assistant to sort out the technology. Yeah, that's it. I know. Yeah, I've got. A, I, I'm, I'm not actually used to being this side of the camera. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As Dan said, uh, my company is Sotic. We deliver very, very high traffic sports websites. This is a lightning talk, so I'm going to talk fast, um, and I'm going to talk about the Six Nations that has just gone by. I haven't prepared this speech, so this is straight off the cuff. Six Nations that just went by, uh, the peak weekend wasn't the end weekend for us. It was the third weekend. If anybody's familiar with what happened on the Six Nations and how it went up and down, uh, I happen to be, there we go, look at that. It's great when your assistant can uh, deliver what you want. Um, that's the website that we delivered. Um, that website is 100% WordPress. That website is hosted on AWS, uh, it's very nice to have their name on it. We got told seven days before that they are the new sponsor and that the site was going to say powered by AWS. The last time they did a sports site where they powered it, which was in Formula One, they needed six months due diligence to check. We had seven days uh, and we passed. Traffic wise, if any of you are wondering how big a WordPress website can go, 49,550 unique visitors a minute. A minute. Right? So I know that lots of people say, oh, we get traffic of this, that, and the other. That's in one minute. And you're sitting there going, and the, the disappointing thing was we're going, come on, 50,000, 50,000, 50,000. And it's like, it's like, you know, it's like, how can you be disappointed when you just don't quite get to 50,000 unique visitors in a minute? And that's how big it was. Uh, the load speed of that site, 
Uh, it is very heavy in some extent, but it loads in about 1.2 seconds on, um, if you watch it on, that's on a permanent loader, the way that the site works. Um, every single element of that is lazy load. Every single element of that is uh, optimized to deliver. Um, we benchmark against some rather very, very large websites. Um, I We did benchmarks against the uh, Guardian today. The Guardian sports section loads in about three and a half seconds, so we're like double the speed of it. So it's quite important. The traffic on that site, the part where I said, we had an 18% increase on organic search traffic. And if you would like to know how much money we spent on SEO and SEO placement, that much. It is all about site speed on SEO. And if anybody tells you about everything else, they will always tell you that the number one thing about the SEO these days and how it works, particularly on Google, is it's all about site speed. If you want to move up the rankings, you have to be doing site speed and you have to be taking it seriously. Um, what does it mean around the back end of that? Just so you're if you're interested, uh, everything on that site is delivered through CDNs. Every single page, every single piece of traffic goes through a content delivery network. Nothing hits the back end of the WordPress site. So the origin of the WordPress site, nothing hits it. It all goes through CDNs. Um, we use a combination of different CDNs, but the main two that we use are one called Strike Tracker, which is high winds. Um, some of you who are gamers will know that from the system called Steam. So if any of you play games where you use Steam, like Championship Manager, where you're f sorry, football, I should, say, I should know considering I, own, I know the owners. What are they now called? Football Manager, aren't they? Yeah. Um, that we're using the same thing. The rest of it's all coming through AWS. On the AWS side, we deliver everything with containers. Does I'm not going to go into this because it's too complicated, but effectively the way it works is that we don't, if you had the old days of there is your server, and then the next thing was virtualization, the, the, the level beyond there is now called containerism, containerization. I don't know if I've got that right. I've just made some words, but they sound good, don't they? Um, so containerization, so we actually deliver different containers. So as the site traffic grows, we spin more containers. At the peak of that, it was running around about 30 servers were running, 30 containers were spinning up and running on that. So although you're still running on a CDN, you'll say, well, why do you need that in the back end? It's just how it works. Everything you try and lock down leaks, coming back to the back end, there is always something else that's gonna just cause that. So I've, have I talked enough for my lightning? Have I gone fast enough? Um, and I think I'm, uh, the Q&A is some other time, isn't it? Yeah. Diane? Am I done? Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, right. Yep. No, thank you. Perfect. Big round of applause, please, for Leo. Thank you. Just a shame that England didn't get it. Okay, uh, so we've got our third and final lightning talk, and this individual's also stepped up this evening, so thank you very much to Theo Shivers. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Shivers, sorry, thank you. Um, so Theo is, where are we? Big round of applause for Theo first. <laughs> Finding the method of startup success. Wow, that's a big topic, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Am I not having the, do I not have the mic too close to my mouth? Because I know I do that quite often. So um, I'm here to pre present Startup Leader Science. It's an initiative that's been launched around two months ago. And uh, Adam was a star guest around two, uh, well now one week ago, for the uh, newest episode. What is Startup Leader Science? The um, tagline is pretty precise. We're finding a method to startup success. You have an idea, you have your own company, are you independent and trying to go through the big world? We're here to help you. So how do we find this method? We go through interviews and articles that cover every single topic, may it be through financing, all the way to maybe testing or managing the, um, the community in general. That's the aim. And recently, what we've um, actually created is a web series of interviews. The first interview being how to start well, and the second interview is how to manage your website, called WordPress and Mysteries. Not only is this an um, initiative through interviews, it also tells a story. 
So who here is independent, by the way? I know that, Adam, you're independent. You're independent as well. So I think we've all been in this situation where <laughs> we try to balance out both our own lives and the company we have next to it. This, to this um, web series covers exactly that. It tells the story of the startup scientist, which is a character I play, trying to find this method of startup success through his own passion. And he goes through uh, balancing out his own life next to having this idea, to having this passion. And Adam, who volunteered to do the second character, thank you very much, is an investor who's grown increasingly tired of seeing good ideas fail. However, he is an, himself an investor. So that means his income is also based on other people's idea. So they are both interested in finding this method, but both for different reasons. The startup leader science, scientist is there for passion, the investor is here for money. But why is he in here for money? It's because his children are starting to grow up and they're gonna need money for their own studies, for their own ideas. And they're both gonna race to find this method. Why am I here today? I'm here to both, well, talk about this initiative. I'm here to find people who are willing to partake in the next episodes. Are you a professional in SEO? Are you, um, do you have a background in finance? Do you have a background with website management? We're interested. All of this is done for free. This is a passion project that I lead completely for free. And uh, the uh, main thing that we have in common, everybody's got a WordPress website. Well, the website's a bit on WordPress. So that's about it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad. If you're interested in partaking, the, partaking in the interviews, I'd be glad. And uh, well, hope to hear from you after this speak. Thank you very much. Theo, thank you, really appreciate that. Uh, can I just ask Theo, would you be happy to stay up here, Louise and Leo? Leo, Theo, sorry. <laughs> would, you, would you be happy to answer some Q&As? Do we have any questions at all for our panel of lightning session speakers? You can sit if you would prefer, yes, absolutely. <laughs> any questions at all? None. <laughs> Three talks and no questions. <laughs> I'm Rana. Hi, Leo. Uh, the question about the, the traffic you, you were getting, and you mentioned the zero spend and uh, nothing with SEO. How did you get the traffic? Uh, good question, Rana. Um, so first of all, it helps to have a site and a product that people know about. It also helps to have a, a thing that the BBC and ITV go and stick your web URL address on TV. Um, the point isn't is that there's a lot of people that are spending a lot of time and money on SEO in that field. So if you type in Six Nations, there is a lot of time and money spent on it. The positive that Google should be doing is because we're the official site, they should be putting us at the top. However, a big thing happened last year, uh, which was the Google One Box. In sport, they came out with this thing called Google One Box. Ma many of you have seen it on various different other elements, but the One Box on sport is that you've got a, um, as you go onto Google, and you'll see the almost all of your answers appearing without having to leave Google. If you're a football fan, you can now sit there and just the minute you type in your football team, it literally tells you the score, it tells you everything about the game without, without you going in there. So that was a big problem and it caused a massive drop off of traffic last year. Um, that is there. The other thing to say about not spending money on SEO um, is that if you build SEO into your build, if you build it into your templates and your themes and you build it into your site builds, a lot of what you're supposed to be doing should be there. And that's the biggest issue I find. A lot of people who sell SEO spend most of their time sorting out what should really be your, uh, you know, your standard stuff is not, fit, is not built. And probably the better person to talk about that would be Louise. Can I ask you one more thing? You and that will be asked by Louise as well. About yeah. your... <laughs> God, sorry, yes. About your site speed, 
Uh, yeah. Did you improve your side speed and did you yeah, find any ch- any uh, changes, uh, any comparison from probably yeah, last year or something? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, PHP 7 point something, I think, Ron. Uh, Big difference. Mm. 7.2. Uh, Nginx. Mm. Everything's on Nginx now. Uh, everything is, you know, we just sit there and you just pull lots and lots of things apart and you don't, there is no magic bullet. I absolutely say that. We've actually spent a lot of time having discussions with people like um, WP Engine who do a great job. They do an absolutely great job. And we've actually said, but the difference, because we've done most of the things that they do, the hygiene factors. If you're really, really bad at all that hygiene, you can really, really pick up a lot of speed. Mm. On the other side, if you're actually doing and spending a lot of time doing it, then, you know, and it's worth doing, you know, then y- you can't. But it's it, 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 there is th- there's never a date. We've just changed all of our all of our images are now changing. We're going to be changing all of our images from JPEGs to WebP. Everything. Thank you. And you mentioned Google Answers. Just one. The last one. <laughs> you mentioned Google Answers. Uh, did I mention Google Answers? Because of the reason the site. Oh uh, uh, yeah, the sorry. We call it one box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So have you found any solution for that? Um. <laughs> Well, we've had account managers who've absolutely gone ballistic at Google, and actually, as you're a big brand, um, you can, but they, it's been tough. It's been tough. It yeah. really, I mean, even getting si- some of the things, like, they w- didn't have the right Six Nations logo. So, I know, you know, y- and but you, you are fighting a battle. I think that is the, that is the trend from I'm Facebook I'm to yeah. all other sites. Yeah. Sorry, I'm afraid we're going to have to move yeah, on just because of time constraints. <laughs> Sorry, lots of, lots of really good stuff here, but I'm afraid we do need to move on. Uh, do we have any other any other questions at all for the other speakers? WebP. WebP is the image format. Excellent. Any any other questions at all? Yep. Back there. I have a question for Louise. Uh, I was just going to say on Web pe- WebP, you can um, you can get it through Cloudflare. There is a WordPress plugin for Cloudflare that sorts out quite a few bits, but it doesn't sort out WebP. So first of all, compress your images using a standard image compression before you bother to go to the effort of sorting out WebP. No, I mean, Tiny Ping, which is what we use, it basically, when you, you can upload any size image, you can set in your theme what image sizes are right for each device size and then do your conditional CSS. But importantly, when it, when it saves out, when WordPress saves out those images, the Tiny Ping plugin that we use will, s- will compress and, re- and remove all the unnecessary data from each of those different image sizes. The other th- service that we've used successfully is Cloudinary, which is a third-party um, image service, and that w- is very good at serving responsive, compressed images in a really fast way. And that's good as well if you if you're wanting a website that's really fast, because at that point you're not hitting your hosting server to actually deliver the images to the website. All right. So it's about uh, the first. Uh, I would like to know about the user experience in the page that you optimized uh, was the first paint like uh, one of the key points and what made you choose WP super cache and the minify HTML what was the criteria behind those two plugins um, I have a developer who made that choice for us um, we actually often use for most of the sites that we're building for our clients we use WP engine and we have an account with them and, and various hosting servers in that um, in this particular instance, the client wanted to use their own hosting, and because we knew they would be getting um, spikes in traffic, we actually were quite fine to leave the hosting to someone else. Um, that was we, we don't have the sort of 24/7 support that Leo offers in that sort of instance. Okay. Um, so basically, mm. we just chose a couple of plugins that we knew would be good at doing the very specific caching and things that we wanted to do. But what the choice was around that particular plugin versus the others, I left that to the engineer, basically. 
or I don't understand and the gravity forms moving into the footer was because of the first paint I suppose which was a key well, it render blocks in the header basically yes absolutely and and gravity forms adds quite a lot it's a quite a few hundred milliseconds to the page load so oh. it's not insignificant at all you know you in and that when you're looking at that sort of speed you only have to double the page load by four or five hundred milliseconds and you're literally doubling the time it takes to load the entire website all right thank you Thank you so much. Um, I think we are going to just move on, but I really want to be a I'd say big, big thank you to the three of you for stepping up tonight to give our uh, lightning sessions. Um, just uh, sorry, the reason we're moving on is because we do have obviously what you've been voting on this evening as well, um, and we are rapidly running out running out of time. Um, the highest voted item that you wanted to talk about this evening was security. So, who voted for security, just out of interest? Come on, there's a view not holding your hands up. Okay, so who wants to start a conversation on security? Yeah. I'm going to start with a really simple thing that we completely use in our company for every single thing that we do now. We chose one password. Now you may use other password management systems, but the one we chose is one password. And once you go over and start using one password, you sit there and you wonder why you never ever did it before. Because we do all our two factor authentication through one password. So I'm not tied to one machine to do two factor authentication. I can literally get into any of our websites from my mobile phone if I need to, wherever I am, or I don't. You know, and it's completely secure because it's going through there. And when a member of staff leaves, we just turn the thing off mm -hmm. on them and that's it. And even the what's the interesting thing about one password is a number of our staff have then signed up to family membership and put their whole of their family on it. Mm. So that will be my starting point. It's, it's really interesting, actually. A lot of security ends up at the squidgy bit behind the screen, not what's going on with the technology. Often, if we are securing ourselves, if we're ensuring that we're using passphrases, if we're ensuring we're using two-factor authentication, a lot of the issues become be get mitigated. It, it really isn't. It's often, yes, there's technology issues. Yes, we need to be aware of what we're doing in terms of the how we're using technology. But if we can start being more secure, if we can ensure we're not using the same password, because I know none of you are using the same password across two sites, are you? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> it is It is this bit. It's about secure. Often, it is about, as Leo just said, secure ourselves, get ourselves right, and actually the rest of the security does start to fall in place. It's really surprising how well things happen. Thank you. Hi, um, two questions. One is your two-factor authentication usage within one password, because the whole point of 2FA is that you separate where the passwords live and where the 2FA is, so that if one is compromised, at least if you're using the other one, they still can't get in. But if you handle both of them, in one password, the moment one password is compromised, everything is compromised, and 2FA will not save you. So what's the point of that? The other question is, if your employee puts their family on one password and then the employee leaves and you turn off their one password account, do they also lose, or like, do their entire family lose their one password data? I can't, I can't answer the second <laughs> question. I, oh, there you go. We I like passing all answers to Louise. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> but yeah, but I like passing high traffic websites to Leo, so that's <laughs> cool. Um, one password for teams, the business side of it, is different from one password for friends and family. So, so, so basically, the business teams account, I'm a, an admin for our entire company and have absolute control over um, who can see what. And we, the way we organise it is each of our clients are in a separate vault and then I have granularity over which team members have access to which vaults as well. So there's certain vaults, for example, that only me and my accounts person have access to because they're to do with company financials. Um, and then there's other vaults that everybody has access to because they're relating to company stuff. But the family side of it is actually a separate product 
within one password. Just out of interest, are, are people aware in, within WordPress core there is a, there is a plugin currently, there's a feature plugin, 2FA, uh, that is intended to potentially at some point be merged into core to actually offer two-factor authentication within WordPress? So to answer your question about the two-factor authentication, so it does actually use an, another thing called Duo. So for you to actually get into there, I still actually, for me to open uh, one password, I have to still push it to uh, Duo for a, my, p my device to be logged in, or I have to get the one piece of paper which is actually sitting next to my will. Um, I, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it is that, that is the case. You know, if you you know, it's sitting in that that folder of the, if uh, worst circumstances piece of folder, that is it. I think the argument actually is that um, I don't think anything will ever be perfect, but I think it's such a leap from where we were, where we were sitting there with passwords which were very similar or just a bit of a change and this that and the other, and when you start using it in anger and you suddenly realise that every single one of your passwords are completely random car characters. And you couldn't guess them anyway if you remember them. You don't remember any of them. And it just takes that whole thing away. GitLab, bang, and it does a two-factor authentication for me to get in. It makes it much better. Okay. Do we want to continue with the security conversation or move on to the next subject? Looks like a move on. Okay. So the next highest subject that was voted for was page builders. <laughs> An audible groan within the room. <laughs> so, there were a lot of people that voted on the page builders. Anybody want to start a conversation on it? Diane, at the back there. Well, you might groan, but it actually helps a designer to try and do some pages when they come from Quark Express in the good old days to over uh, Adobe in design and then suddenly you can create pages on the web as well. So uh, for me uh, at the moment Elementor has been the great thing with a load of updates coming in lately with a lot of optimization and I can't give you all the final terms on that but it's really good. It's interesting we all groaned there and yet we've got <laughs> Gutenberg at the core. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, there must be more of a conversation on page builders than this, other than. Oh, the votes. Come on, who voted? You must have an opinion. Adam, at the back there. One thing I would like to say about themes and builders, uh, as uh, I mentioned, a lot of them have things like the WP Bakery built in. So things like Bridge, I think, has it built in. The Salient theme has it built in. We've got quite a few websites at the moment that are showing up as vulnerable. Uh, because the WP Bakery needs to be updated, but the theme's not been updated yet to incorporate the latest version of WP Bakery. So it's another reason for kind of staying away from themes, especially with built-in um, uh, built uh, uh, page builders, because you could end up in that situation. I think the, the issue there is the bundled plugins with themes, isn't it? So... What if I told you we develop a, we've developed a site using a page builder, uses Beaver Builder at the core, averages 400 milliseconds page load. Is that acceptable? <laughs> What's the problem with the page builder if that is the result? No. Genuinely, we didn't. We didn't. <laughs> Genuinely, we didn't tweak the page builder beyond what we would do as a as a uh, if we used Beef Builder at the core. So, really, not much beyond what its core functionality offers. I think with Page Builder, there is a chance of switching off a lot of extensions. You don't need those coming with the Page Builder, and if you do that, you take it out of the system and it doesn't load. So that makes the pages much faster. And it's a matter of learning how to use the page builders rather than criticizing them maybe. And I know about the, uh, the VP ba Baker and that was a terrible one to work with. 
Okay. Any any other thoughts, conversations, discussion around page builders? It was the second highest we've topic. Had si we've had similar results to you. Mm -hmm. you know? But I th again, we only use page um, Beaver Builder. Sorry, we don't use any others at all. You know, some of the others I wouldn't touch with a barge pole. But you know, Beaver Builder we found works very very well. And some very very big agencies use Beaver Builder. Yeah. So I think it's not something to be shy shied away from really personally. Personally, I find it's always interesting this discussion because it's like, ooh, there's this thing that we don't like as a community, but actually, it's a tool. And if we use tools right, ultimately, it comes down to how we use the tool that we've been given. Um, and yes, of course, there are some horrendous options and issues uh, with page builders, but of course, there are also some really positive experiences. So does, would you class Gothenburg as a page builder? And my question is, who here is using that over and above Beaver Builder and we've, we've got clients that ha we have a Beaver Builder site, but are using Gothenburg. Dep so it depends on the uh, depends on the requirements of depends on the requirements of the user. So some users are just producing news content and they'll use the Gutenberg editor for that news content and that's that's a restricted version of Gutenberg. Um, and then we've got, we've obviously set various admin, uh, various roles uh, dependent on, requir on the user's requirements. At, at the moment, I'm my, um, my task at the moment where I work is I'm converting all the short codes from our page into Gutenblocks. So, uh, so it's kind of um, like happy to see the end of the page builder because it is a short code based page builder, which everybody that knows me knows that's my pet hate. <laughs> um, and so at the moment I'm going through uh, all the short codes and turning them into gut and blocks. So um, it's quite an interesting, um, uh, like quite an interesting experience. And also as well, you know, kind of um, quite, um, quite interesting uh, trying to see what Gutenberg can recreate because, you know, we in the development team think it's all fantastic, we're getting rid of this page builder, but we're having like user feedback, which is quite interesting because they want it to be as user friendly as what they had previously. So it's, it's, an, it's an interesting way of sort of seeing the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, do we want to continue with the page builder conversation or move on? <laughs> Very clear now. So I think we'll just skip over the Gutenberg conversation, shall we? <laughs> so uh, very quickly, last one. Headless CMS. Headless WordPress. Lots of wee. Love this. So who wants to start a conversation on headless CMS? Headless WordPress. So in my area, this is going to be, there's, there's two big areas that are going to come out in the next year, I, I believe. PWA, and if you're not building sites to be PWA, you're gonna that speed curve we were talking about. The next and only thing is going to be PWA, and the next big area is this headless CMS. And everybody's saying, "What is headless CMS?" Well, actually, you know, they're also sort about uh, AI and ML, but when <laughs> nobody actually knows what actually that means, apart from the agencies selling it. Um, headless CMS, why? This is why people want it. If you think that your content has to appear in more than one location, then you need to be looking at a headless CMS. What that means is that you build content so that it appears on a mobile app or on a website or a another. It needs to be decoupled from the front end delivery to do it. Actually, that's really, really difficult because all of the things you're expecting to be able to do, like, oh, well, I just dropped that uh, Twitter ta uh, thing in, and of course, because WordPress understands it, it's gonna display. And then you do into headless CMS, and it doesn't do that. So it's gonna be really difficult, so we're gonna be taking steps back. It's almost like, say, changing the editor to a, a block editor instead of uh, what you're used to. So it's that sort of big change. Um, do I think it's gonna be interesting? Yes because we like the idea of digital asset management for holding all your pictures. We all 
understand that concept. We all understand holding our videos in video libraries that we can actually then gain. So long term, the headless CMS approach of holding your content in there is there. That's my 10 seconds on it. <laughs> Make it 30. What's PWA? Progressive Web Apps. Progressive Web Apps um, actually started by, can anybody tell me which company it started by? You'll get it wrong. It wasn't Google, it was Apple. <laughs> Apple started PWA. It was in Safari at the beginning. That was where it started. That was the thing I read, maybe it was wrong. It was started in Safari and then Apple have not sort of supported it. But it's the idea that you can actually build a an app uh, complete, almost works exactly like a native app, but on a on a web. Out of interest, have we got people here that have developed headless uh, headless sites using a headless CMS? Um, we ran a three-hour workshop down in WordCamp mm -hmm. Brighton last summer, where we built a headless CMS website using Gatsby. So if you look on our blog there's the workshop and we also open sourced various bits and pieces of code that we needed to do it and including the theme as well and Zach Gordon is doing some interesting stuff at the moment with a he using WordPress as a headless CMS and I think they they might have even released the first 29 a version of the 2019 theme with Gatsby or if they haven't it's coming very soon as well hmm. I think we had a couple and of we've got a client, client site using WordPress and mm -hmm. as, uh, as um, a back end and Gatsby as a front end. So what would what would be the one major benefit? Speed and as Leo said, you, you're decoupling your content from your front end. So at that point you, you, you can keep a nice editing experience but do interesting things with the content. So y you know you could you can consider the WordPress that you could have content within WordPress that actually doesn't ever see the front end of the website but might be related to an app but you're using the one content management system as your source of truth and then the other thing is if you're using Jamstack which is JavaScript APIs mark, mark up, mark down, um, mark up, whatever, whichever way it is um, you, you can then pull in other stuff so for example we've um, experimented with Cloudinary for images as I said earlier and, and so you're not hitting the hosting server to even get assets you, and depending on how you do it you're deploying the website to something like Netlify as a static site so you never actually hit the hosting server and you can then control things like security because actually if, you're, if, you're, if nobody's ever going to the WordPress website you don't need to worry about updating it mm -hmm. so you you don't necessarily need to answer yourself here, Louise, but anybody here? If you are running if you're familiar with WordPress and you are familiar with plugins and the concept of plugins and then you're talking about headless CMS, how does all that fall into the mix? Do you want to answer? <laughs> I can I can answer some of it. I mean we had to we had to do something to get things like Yoast SEO to get the metadata out into the REST API. Um, as I say we 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 pushed images from the media library up to Cloudinary. Um, you can't do things like install a forms plugin, but if you use something like Netlify for hosting, which is a static hosting service, then they have a forms solution that you can then write Lambda functions to do other things as well. So, but as you say, you have to be very judicious in your use of plugins and you have to stop clients from thinking that they can solve a problem like, oh, I want to embed Instagram so I'm just going to use an Instagram plugin because that just simply won't work. But the thing I'm also interested in is with Gatsby which is going down the component route in React and, and then um, Gutenberg which is also React and components it's then getting to the point where you can start to think but in interesting ways about components and the content and how you deliver them on the front end. So I think WordPress is an mm -hmm. interesting solution. Yes, yeah. I think it, it's really exciting times, isn't it? There's lots, there's lots going on within our, within our, within our space at the moment. Um, unfortunately, we are actually over time, so <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers tonight and everybody that's contributed. So please, big round of applause.
Just before we finish up, just want to say a very quick thank you to our sponsors, SiteGround, WP Engine, Plesk, Wegot, and Yoti for helping make this happen this evening. Um, we are always interested in your feedback. If you have anything to say, please visit wpnup.org, uh, no, wpldn.uk slash feedback. Uh, you'll be redirected to a Google form and you'll have to answer a maximum of four questions. Uh, we are, as I say, very interested in all of your feedback. If you want to just have a chat with any one of us uh, organisers, myself, Gary, Diane or Paul over there, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Next event will be the 25th of April in here. Uh, myself and Paul won't be here. It'll be the first event in six years I've not been here for. <laughs> I've got to speak somewhere else. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> life? <laughs> We'd love to see you all here, please. 25th of Feb. We are always on the last Thursday of every month. Uh, so just stick it in your calendar as a reoccurring event. We'd love to see you here. Uh, we are now going to head over to whatever the pub's called, the Cross Keys. <laughs> Sorry, the Cross Keys for... Uh, to continue some networking, socialising, uh, and just generally getting to know one another. If you can join us, if you head not out the front door, because we can't get out the front door, <laughs> so um, down to the lift, down the stairs, take a left out the doors and kind of work your way through. Just stick with somebody who knows where they're going, maybe. <laughs> That's the one. Thank you. Other than that, very quick, very quick. I had a couple of questions today about the fact that I do the streaming. Um, and this is a complete plug for uh, WordCamp London. Uh, I will be doing a session on the Contributor Day on this coming Friday, not next Friday, about why and how I do streaming and that sort of stuff. So if this if you want to learn about that sort of thing, how we put that into WordPress, please come to WordCamp. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I was just going to give WordCamp a final, final mention. It would be amazing to see each and every one of you at WordCamp, if you can make it uh, at WordCamp London. Uh, please do. If you can't, please let somebody else know within your network that WordCamp London is happening. Uh, as I say, it's a three-day tech conference in the centre of London with a whole ream of stuff going on for 40 pounds. I mean, you really can't go wrong. We'd love to see you there. Other than that, uh, I won't see you in April, we'll see you in May, but the rest of the team will see you in April. Thank you very much, good night.